of anyone here. So um, I welcome you to this session on um, grain production and uh, NOFA New Jersey's grain production series. Uh, this is on processing and marketing and we have a real treat for you today because we have via video some superb examples of processing and then also we have homegrown New Jersey processing in in the flesh a uh, River Valley community grains we're going to start out with a, an excellent video produced by Kennett Productions um, that features two different but similar grain processing um, enterprises. The first one is Henry Byler in central Pennsylvania. You won't see Henry because Henry is Amish, but he otherwise he's thrown open all his um, all his enterprise to us. And that'll be followed by Joel Steigman of Small Valley Milling. So it looks like we're queued up to hit that video. So away we go. So we're on the farm today of Henry Byler. It's called Wholesome Acre Farms. Um, Henry's farm is near Watsontown, Pennsylvania, so that's close to Williamsport, Pennsylvania. Um, and we're here. Uh, Henry is, is does both uh, grain production and processing, but at this time of year the crops have been harvested, so we're going to focus on his processing enterprise. And Henry's um, processing enterprise is an excellent example of how successful farmers can be in on-farm processing. Um, he's built a mill house, which we're about to visit, and in that mill house, he not only has a mill, a small-scale mill that you'll see, uh, but he also has a dehulling machine, which he himself has developed. The dehulling machine is a critical component for those of you that want to grow the ancient wheats or any grain that's in a hull, uh, for example, einkorn, emmer, and spelt. These ancient wheats have high market potential, but they don't thresh clean in the combine or thresher. They hold on to their hulls. So you need an extra step to get them ready for milling or selling as uh, berries. And Henry, you're going to see Henry's uh, dehulling machine. He um, actually got plans from Nigel Tudor. Nigel Tudor is another excellent example of a farmer miller processor in uh, south of Pittsburgh and Henry has redesigned the decolor a bit you'll see how it operates it works extremely well on einkorn emmer and spelt and can also do some other grains so yeah this upper where the grain goes in and this right here inside here is the deholing and the milling mechanism and if you come around the other side here, what you see here, this is built that we can either, we can, we can put this on, put a shaft and a bearing on to mount the flails on inside, or we can leave this off and mount an electric motor right in there. The shaft goes inside and the flails mount right on the electric motor. <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's small. It's, it's really very simple. And what is it, what is it, what is it used for? Uh, for for deholding, uh, you can run it at slow speed with deholding screens, and then you can dehold. Or let's take the deholding screens out, put flower screens in, which is a real fine screen. Uh, change your speed, up your speed to around, around three thousand, and then you can mill flour with it. And how much? And so this, do you call this a trumpet mill? Trumpet mill. Uh huh. And how much does this cost? As a price on this, with the, the shaft and the bearings as a belt drive, it's certainly mm -hmm. that you choose the flower screen. Mm -hmm. So, for example, I just bought one for Ogren for my organization, and it cost fifteen seventy seventy five with um, some extra screens for dehauling. Yeah. So I think I'm getting a screen that works for einkorn, and then another screen that works for spelt and emmer. Um, so, and that does, that does not include the right? I'm, yes, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to be taking one of these with me today and having it fitted out with, uh, I think it's a 10 horsepower motor and, um, then it'll be mounted, um, so that, uh, in my case, I'll be bringing it around to some very small 
farms that are just starting to try. They have like a quarter acre of vine corn. So this is a perfect opportunity for them to see if they can, uh, this, this kind of small scale equipment is perfect for, for farmers to get started because it's not, it works really well, as you'll see, but it's not, it's not uh, expensive. And the idea, next step brings us back to the, the first idea of this is a real small scale machine that a farmer can start. So, so once the farmer grows more, uh, the deholing capacity, this may not be enough anymore. So then they can upgrade to a bigger deholder and use this just for a mill. And they'll have to, to change it around any time. And you'll see, you'll see a standalone deholder that, that has a higher throughput in just a minute um, in Henry's mill house. So this is einkorn going into the hopper. And Henry, is this new on top there? What is that? And that is uh, something I set up to do an air recirculation. Oh. That picks up the stuff that comes off the scalping screen and pulls it back up into the box. And then I can either open this up and drop the grain back in or. So that saves you from having to manually collect the yeah. undehulled kernels and recirculate it by hand. And is it working well? Uh, I was wondering if it was drop it by itself. I see. Uh -huh. Nevertheless, it saves work. It does. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's what that was. Neat. So this is your large, what I call your larger scale dedicated dehuller. This is only meant for dehulling, correct? Yes. Yeah. And what's the mechanism? Uh, there's a there's a, a woven wire screen, a circle, ten inch diameter on the inside there. And then there's flails on the end set side. There's four flails that roll around in there. And the idea is that you fill that with a fair amount of grain. You don't want just a little bit of grain. You want a fair amount of grain in there, and that will swirl it in there, in there on the on the wooden wire screen, and actually kind of peels the holes off. And when the holes are peeled off, it'll work down through the screen, drop out the bottom. First then we have this dust collector pipe up here to pull air up. That pulls some of the light pulls off, it pulls the dust off, and then the rest falls down and goes over the cleaner of being separated different ways. Stuff that's not evil would come down this tray, this trial here, gets sucked into the pipe and gets pulled back over, gets dropped back down in the in the box. And then um, what are these other, uh, where does the grain come out, the clean uh, dehull? The clean grain falls down through, and then there's a fan there, blowing air up, and the grain will fall down through the air column, slides on down, and we put this box underneath to catch the finished grain. So, so we're always, as it is running, there's clean grain falling out the bottom. And this air column is also blowing up, which is blowing up through the grain, we blow it hard enough that it picks up the lightest kernels, any kernels that fall down through that are not deholed, and it'll blow them up here. The heaviest stuff drops down here, comes down in this, this box. The strong here, lighter stuff is going back in this bag. Uh, there's usually almost no kernels in this bag. There's lots of kernels in here. These are smaller kernels, cracked kernels, and those go always just go back in the box. Although we do like to keep these separate, do them later, and that that is milled for pie and pastries, uh, cake, cookies, stuff like that. We always like to use the first time through. We like to use that for the bread flour. The biggest, we like to have the biggest, nicest kernels for bread flour. And how is this powered? <coughs> powered. Uh, there's a mine shaft, shaft coming in from a diesel that's outside. And then belts down to the, to the mill. But you sold a number of these that are being powered with a with a ten horsepower motor, correct? Yeah. And you can also I've seen one of them at least it's equipped with a dig digital readout. Is that right? Uh, For speed? For speed. Yeah. 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 
EFT. Uh, I think Stuart Stuart has one with that. Yeah. So you can you can you can power this however you want, but the mechanism is is uh, the same. And and this is this is it's from this. This was 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 uh, reimagined from designs you got from from Nigel Tudor. Correct. Yeah. This is not an impact dehuller. This is an abrasion dehuller. So it's it's abrading through that screen as opposed to an in, impact dehuller. But this is particularly good for the hull hull grains. So it's just an excellent job. Why don't you talk us through the mail first? This one you can actually show them the mechanism, can't you? Or is it too, is that too hard? What I like about this machine too is that it's really easy. The one I have been using to change screens and um, so there you can see what you saw before. And here, instead of having a screen all the way around, there's a there's what I call a half screen, right? Can you get a photo of the a picture of the screen too? Yeah. So there's that. That's the flower screen. And is that the finest mesh you can order? Or? I think that is the finest mesh. Yeah, makes a nice flower. And. The innards of that look very much like the dehullery just showed you, with the exception that it, the screen goes all the way around. And the idea of this was to have a machine that is easy to change, change the screen. Just have these clamps up here. The old machine did have a slot. I had to slide these screens in, and of course everything was filled up with. Filled up with flour, and it's always so hard to change the screen. And of course, this, we can take this off, and we can brush it down, we can blow it down. Where the old machine, you couldn't get it to the bottom of it. If you could clean it out, and you had this iron on the inside, and all these pieces of had a rust build up in there. Great. Yeah, no, I think now if we could just see everything in operation, that would be fantastic. this um the reveal <laughs> um it's better with the mask on um this you can see are there some are there some hulls still in evidence yes but very few so few in fact that you can easily henry is selling this as berries to uh end users um and he's and then he also as you as you saw is milling this so there are a few hulls left um they really don't uh, impact quality much at all. And of course, for a home buyer, somebody who's, who's using it at home, if you're, if you're going to use this to make a, a rice substitute dish, we always recommend that you wash it anyway. So if you, if you put this in a bowl of water, all, all the remaining hull will come and you can, just, you can just take them off. But I don't bother to do that. Why? Because the hull has, has good things in for you. So this is, 
this is just a very, very high quality product that Henry is getting with, amazingly, that's a fanning mill. It's a fanning mill that he's refined and he's gotten exactly the right screens and it does the job for him. And, and if he can do it, then the rest of us can eventually figure it out too. I, I usually tell people that, uh, yes, we still have some holes on here. Uh, doesn't look like a perfect product, but we're doing it with cheap equipment. <clears throat> we have a very low cost product here. If we would upgrade to a gravity if we table, would put a gravity table in. Yes, we could have a hundred percent clean product, no holes, but the price would be would go up according. Yeah. So this is the low cost way to do it, and it works. And in the in the in the future, maybe three five years down the line, we may have a low cost gravity table that you can pair. But for for now, this does a very good job, and. Um, I've asked my customers and we have the same, I mean, I've had a new customers have asked about these holes, but yeah, I've, I've never had a, a customer that, oh, they just don't like these holes, or they just get rid of these holes, I've never, I've never had that. Yeah, so this is, this is a beautiful, beautiful product and it's a very high market, highly marketable product that can sell once it reaches this stage or in the flower stage for a high price as high a price as a, um, a vegetable per unit land area. And that's what we're interested in because we want even vegetable growers to grow this. It's a beautiful rotation crop for a vegetable farm. And if you can produce the same amount of money, you know, now we're not talking about a cover crop. I love cover crops, but most people can't afford them all the time. You're still keeping the land in production. You're pushing organic matter into the soil, restoring the soil. And you're you're breaking the pest and disease cycles for a lot of your vegetable species. So this can work at a larger scale, at a micro scale. And now we have the equipment thanks to people like Henry and Nigel uh, that farmers can actually afford. It. Um, we're now at Small Valley Milling um, near Halifax, Pennsylvania. So we're a little bit north of Harrisburg, out in rural Dauphin County. And sitting next to me at an appropriate social distance is Joel Steigman who's one of the owners and operators of Small Valley Milling, along with his wife Elaine and his son Eric. And they're very, very busy, but they've uh, given us a little bit of time today to sh help you see what they've been up to. And I wanted to point out the contrast between uh, what the Steigmans are doing here and what you saw at Henry Byler's, which is a, a small-scale operation. Um, there are many, many mills that are bigger than the Steigmans, but in the organic community in the Northeast, this is a large size mill. Um, and the interesting thing about the Steigmans, just like Henry Byler, is that they're farmer millers, farmer processors. I know you do all sorts of things at the mill, you, you mill, but you're also doing a lot of the farming now, right? Right. And so, um, can you, you're, you're certified organic? We're certified organic, so that means I'm dying, we're talking about 300 feet Oh, just the way the economy's going, we we used to raise like 100 acres of hay, and now since the dairy guys are having problems with the hay market's pretty bad, we're shifting more to some small grains, and because of the weather, we're cutting back on our corn acres and uh, trying some sorghum. This is the first year I tried no, I shouldn't say. This is the first year I tried no till soybean. They had a meeting up here about no-till organic, no-till beans, and we tried that, so I have like seven acres of that. And you grew, you grew spring bar hollis barley this year. Hollis barley, actually kept last year. Yeah, so you're always, but he, your initial, one of your initial innovations in terms of crops was when you started growing spelt. And that was, what, around 1999? Something like that. Yeah. And so what... Why did you Why did you decide to try spelt? Money. <laughs> That's a good answer. <laughs> well, we were struggling, you know, when you're conventional and uh, the taxes and everything. My wife and I always were working away, and then we were farming on the side, and you know, you couldn't hardly make ends meet. And we sold this wheat to another organic mill, and he said, "Well, oh, there's some pretty lucrative thing called spelt." And I said, "Well, what's that like?" And then uh, he told us, and another guy and I went out to Ohio and got a ton of uh, 
spelt to bring back and you know the planning and um, well we talked about that before but the, uh, there's a sale over here and they have a oat roller or an oat uh, de hauler for a public sale they bought that and they figured out that de hauled the uh, spelt and that was the beginning of the spelt business. And so so spelt is one of your still one of your main crops, right? Yep. So how how many acres of spelt do you grow on your farm? It varies. And how, but you buy in too oh, the demand. We buy, yeah, we have uh, we have guys. There's a lot of organic guys around here. Raised north, we have organic guys in Michigan. And, yeah, we put well. There's a thirty thousand bushel bin there. We sell that. We probably. We might have like 50,000 bushels of spelt a year. And so in the mill, you make that into various products, right? We sell kernels, we sell white flour, we sell whole flour. And you sell puffed spelt, yeah. which is one of my favorites. It's just a delicious. Yeah. I'm working my way through five pounds now, so it's, it's terrific. So um, one of the reasons I think you've told me before and I've heard from other spelt growers is that spelt is a nice crop. It's one of these ancient grains, but it, it can yield almost as much as wheat in the hull, correct? Right. So you get a fairly decent yield. So those of you that are that are thinking about some of these grains, one of the great things about spelt is that it has a fairly good yield on it. Of course, you have to subtract 25, 35% to take when you take the hulls off. But it's a, it's a sturdy crop. You can plant it late if you have to. Is that right? Inside the seed there, it's about the only way this 
can surf them through these different uh, uh, grades of fluoridation until it ends up with a smooth. And the grand flakes, uh, like grand, like the people who are saying, the people like me. So you. So this roller mill that you had, you bought the rolls <coughs> used, right? Bought the whole thing, yeah, used, yeah. Because that would cost several hundred thousand dollars, yeah, new. Yeah, new roller mills are going to be a hundred thousand or half a million or whatever. I think we bought the eight cents and uh, four roll stands that made like eight thousand dollars. So, so you. So I, so I always say that Small Valley Milling is just the best example that I know of of people who really are clever about building a business. And um, in addition to the roller mill, what other mills do you use? Oh, the hammer mill and uh, the stone mill. One thing I think is interesting, we use uh, uh, pneumatic systems where uh, we don't use bucket elevators when we're, when we're processing the flour. Everything is sucked in air through a pipe to the next station we was going to. People say that stone milling oh, is so much cooler. We've taken brothers' thermometers and uh, the hammer mill, the stone mill, and the uh, roller mill. It's all about the same with a couple of degrees. So, uh, about different degrees. That's that whole thing. Now, if you didn't, if you would just hammer mill that, roll it, I think maybe those would they'd be hotter. They'd stay hotter, let's put it that way. But when you got cold air coming from there, that's a good dry, point. They are coming from there. The process either way, it was a tremendous. And that keeps the quality of the flower high. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of the word quality, one of the other big defining features of of your operation is your really almost ruthless emphasis on, on high quality. Oh, that's Oh, that's one thing about spelt. If you come up when you combine wheat and in the field and you smell it, it smells fresh and good. But you let it in the bin for six months or longer, it loses that freshness. Where we store this spelt in the hole, it doesn't come in contact with the air because we can hull it. And usually we de hull it with one step, it blows over, it gets filled with power. Either that day or the next day. So it stays fresh, and I think that's why it smells sweet and fresh and more aroma. That's right. You also, I know that, you know, throughout their assembly line, you use a lot of magnets. You're trying to keep any, any metal contamination out. And then when you package, you uh, describe what you do to try to keep the product fresh even when it reaches somebody else's shelf. No, we, uh, our vacuum system in. We have uh, we vacuum pack the grains with the plastic and it has CO2 in it. So that it sucks out the air. The air is what makes it oxidized to me. So it does two things. If there's any bugs in there, the bugs, people don't believe this, but the bugs are laid in the field and you can't see it. And it takes two things. It takes moisture and heat. When they get the right moisture and heat, they come alive and they grow out so these are grain weevils, yeah. Grain weevils. Yeah, they're just swine. <laughs> <laughs> so we have this vacuum pack in there that it sucks out the oxygen and it puts in a certain amount of CO2 in there to back the seal. And we kept grain for three years, you know, in this bag, plastic bag that you pick from the right size to open up and you know, just like you put it. So one of the other interesting things about Small Valley Milling, and you you correct me if I'm wrong, but they they sell they they sell a lot of wholesale. You sell lots of bulk orders, and I know that's what you like. But they also have an online store, and I think you get quite a bit of customers that way too. Yeah, and especially through the the pandemic, I bet you were getting orders. Yeah, yeah. So. It's innovative marketing as well, um, uh, but I think you know that quality is is so important, and that and people know when they buy a small valley milling product, it's going to be yeah. Clean room here, we get grain in from the field or 
somebody else or whatever. We run it through that tree cleaner and takes out uh, the dust and the uh, broken kernels, the weed seed, the dust, and whatever. And uh, before it ever gets to it, it goes into storage. So we do that. I'm trying to think what else. Oh, the other thing I like, I'm into this thing more than Eric and Blaine, is this value added market like she's talking about. They pump stuff, they got uh, let's just call it the nose roller, and that's picking up. And I want to, I pull around right now with the screw base and uh, either cereal or snacks or whatever, but uh, right now that's a little rough. Yeah. But you always have to start out. Yeah. Yeah. So at a different scale, you're seeing you're seeing what you know what Henry is, was doing as well. Use your own labor as much as you can if you're starting out. It helps if you you know Henry's a carpenter. These folks are master. They know how to build things. They know how to fix things. Those buildings you built, right? Just he and his son. In fact, I remember when the mill was just about ready to start up. The only thing you didn't do was the electrical work, right? Because that was so intense and you wanted to have it exactly right. Yeah. The other thing is that, um, correct me if I'm wrong, you were you started out by dehauling. They had a dehauling enterprise. And at one point, they must have been the only dehauler in the Northeast. I think they were the first. So they started with the Ross Camp. They now have a... Kodima, which is another impact dehauler. We saw an abrasion type at Henry's. And so that is the basic processing step that allows you to make money selling spell. Um, and but they started, they wanted to get into the flower business, but they were building the mill slowly by slowly, um, as my Kenyan friends would say. And um, they uh, they did something which I think is really brilliant. They had another mill mill it for you, but they labeled it and started selling it as their product. Is that right? And what did that do for you? That got us a uh, market. You know, that was our market where uh, we didn't we didn't have the infrastructure to buy all this equipment and sit there and hope somebody would come and buy some. So we had there's another organic like she said in down Anvil and I said After a while, that wore out. Then we went up to Staples there, and uh, we kept getting bigger. I'd take the money to track the trail of the grain and uh, take it up there. And they said, oh, I can't do it right now. We're too busy, just like Eric is right now. Can you imagine if somebody come in here with a truck and say, hey, I need this ground right now? Yeah. So anyway, that's what forced us into the roller mill business. You know, we had to make up our mind. Well, we were selling, like Elizabeth said, we were selling uh, grain kernels. And then that's all we, everybody says, is that all you have? Don't you have anything else? Well, then we got to mix up. I told you how we got started the flower business. Then after that, it just keeps going. Don't you have anything else? <laughs> so we just keep adding a little of this. It just picks up. Yeah. Um, would you say there's anything, any, what, what am I missing? I mean, there's so much that's interesting about your business. And we'll see a little bit of it. They're very busy, and it's COVID time, so we don't want to intrude. But, um, oh, I know what I wanted to, wanted you to talk about a little bit. One of the very striking things when you come to the mill are all the bins. Right. And um, Joel and I have both seen total disasters. Starting farmers, especially if they have never grown grains before, are they usually overlook a critical factor, which is storage. You cannot sell the crop out of the field. It's almost impossible to do that, which means you have to be able to safely store it. The longer you can safely store it, the more you have a chance of really making money because you can pick and choose your markets. And at the, at the small scale, you saw what Henry was doing. That's fine. At that scale, it's working for him. But once you get to a certain scale, if you're growing, if you have a 10 acre field, what do you think? What are your options for storage? A bin, right? A bin up, yeah. yeah. That's the other thing. Uh, these guys combine this stuff, 
they'll bring it in here and we have all these bins here but they don't all have dryers on so you want this grain to be like 12 percent for storage so they'll come in here with a 15 16 percent of the stuff what are you going to do with it if i don't have a bin with a dryer in you're in trouble yeah <laughs> you know you need a bin with a dryer you need a fan and so in bug that's the other thing now we we been harping on these guys that we buy from here. Do you have bugs? Oh no, I don't have any bugs in my drain. Uh, <laughs> this year, same thing. We have those screens. We were actually thinking of buying our growers a set of those screens and giving them to them so that they can check their drain and they can see the bugs crawling around. Because it seems like two guys came so far this year. Came in here, Eric, get a sample. You see the bugs crawling around. I don't want those bugs in my 30,000 bushel bin eating as the other guys. I already paid him for that grain. And if those bugs eat the grain, they kill the quality. So he rejected two guys that were been here for a long time. Yeah. He said, take it back. When you got dead bugs, I'll buy it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that that's, um, again, that comes back to quality. And you notice that they're, they're insisting on quality right out of the field. You also do your own testing, right? Yeah. You test for vomitoxin, protein, yeah. falling number. Yeah. Um, and that way um, they know what they're getting. And, and for any, any any of you that are that are gonna grow grains, those three parameters that for food grade material, those three parameters we just mentioned, vomitoxin, falling number, protein. You have to provide those figures or work with a processing entity that will test them for you. Nobody's going to buy your grain if they don't know what they're buying, and that's as it should be. So whether you're working on a small scale or a large scale, that testing is important. Entities like Small Valley Milling that are buying in will do the testing, but there are also a whole bunch of labs that we can talk about later that will, will test your grain. It's, it's, it's really critically important because the whole of our Northeast grain Specialty economy, specialty grain economy is based on quality. So the, the principle here is don't be overwhelmed by all the bins you're seeing because the, the Steigman started out with nothing. Oh, no bins at all. You just, they just build up gradually. And the point is, is keep your eyes open for used bins or start checking into you know, figure out how much, approximately how much grain you're going to be producing on a particular field and start looking at bin, uh, you know, what what does a small hopper bin cost and so forth. I'll tell you what, one thing that's uh, really becoming available now, a lot of these farms that are close to towns or cities have bins on them and the developer will buy the farm, he doesn't want the bins, he'll just about tell you to take them for nothing. Yeah. Yeah, and so you can... Usually you can buy a bin uh, for the value of a new, a new uh, burner and a floor cost. So, but you got to look to see if they aren't rotted out along the bottom. What that's the right. Looks like. but there's good guys out there, but you've got to be shopping. Yeah, that's right. And that's what Small Valley has been doing from the very beginning. They're, they're very smart, very canny. And um, sometimes you have to wait a while to find what you need. Yeah, so um, thanks for listening to the video. I'm sorry the sound was somewhat compromised, but we'll post the video separately and you should be able to get good sound quality then. Um, I just want to emphasize that uh, Henry was showing you small scale einkorn dehulling and milling and Joel a larger scale enterprise that that uh, dehulls and mills a whole bunch of different grains. So maybe we can now turn to a New Jersey homegrown uh, processing and marketing um, enterprise. So Len and Larry, do you want to take it away? Yes, I'll, I'll start with the processing. Um, 
just want to say thanks for everybody for attending this evening. Um, thanks, thank you as well to uh, Nagisa and Nofa, New Jersey for uh, putting these together. And thank you to Elizabeth as well. Um, the first piece of equipment that we purchased um, was a grain cleaner, a uh, Sosnowski grain cleaner in the summer of 2018. And um, the grain cleaner uh, uses airflow created by centri centrifugal force to separate the clean grain from the residual material. Len, and do you want them to play your PowerPoint so they can see the to see these pieces of equipment? Yes, Amanda, do you have that? I sure do. Want it up now? Thank you. Absolutely, my pleasure. Can you see that okay? Yes. And then that first uh, photo there where the grain cleaner is on the left side there. Sure, sure thing. I will say, um, I'm not seeing what you're seeing. All The only thing this keeps bringing up is principles of processing. So you're going to have to guide me through. Okay. So it's the, um, the first, the photo where there's a gravity wagon, a big red wagon in the background and there's sure. bags and there's a machine there on the left. I'm just going to stop sharing and uh, close out of the other ones. I'm sorry. I think I'm having a technical difficulty here. Let's see. Okay. There we go. Great. Yes. Thank you. My pleasure. Sorry about that. No problem. So that's the uh, Sosnowski grain cleaner there on the um, left hand side. It has the bag attached to where the uh, debris, the residual material goes into that bag, that white bag. Um, and that's my, my wife Sue there cleaning uh, while we're putting sort of just going through making sure everything is cleaned out and then we're putting them into the tote bags. Um, we had, again, purchased the grain cleaner in the summer of 2018, and we had assembled it at um, Kimball's farm, Kent Kimball in Bel Belvedere, New Jersey, and um, harvested a warthog crop. And so we uh, helped Kent with the grain cleaner, uh, clean, his, clean the winter wheat. Um, and we had also coordinated with another farmer nearby, uh, Mike back here at Genesis Farm. And we helped to transport the grain cleaner uh, so that um, Mike can use as well. Uh, he had done a small, um, small harvest of, I believe, winter wheat as well. And what the reason why we had purchased this grain cleaner because the year before we had actually, uh, from Elizabeth's help, he had actually brought down an air screen cleaner. I believe it was from the 1930s. And while it did a, a great job for what was needed at that time, uh, we figured, well, we want to start putting the infrastructure pieces in place. And what better place to start than with the cleaner? And that's why, again, in the summer of 2018, um, we, we purchased the Sosnowski and um, we've been able to, through the the last two years coordinate with several farmers again in the area to sort of transport uh, the cleaner um, when needed. Um, then and can, the I, can I just mention Len that that cleaner is one of the few that I would recommend buying new and it costs around three thousand dollars for the smaller unit right? That's correct yes yes that is correct and um, it's really has helped us immeasurably and we've been very happy with it. It's been very efficient. And um, um, so again, that was the first piece, the first infrastructure piece we put in place. And then in um, early winter now, 2019, um, again, with Elizabeth's help, uh, we purchased an oat roll. Um, so now that we have both the Sosnowski grain cleaner and oat roller, um, okay, where are you going to store these, um, these pieces of equipment? We were fortunate that Mike back here at Genesis Farm was able to store the Sosnowski at the barn there at Genesis Farm. 
And then we purchased the old roller while we rented out space at a commercial kitchen in Long Valley, New Jersey, the Red Barn Kitchen Incubator. And that's where we store the oat roller and we're able to process there and roll oats. And that was in the, again, early winter of um, 2009, 2019. Um, and that's where we currently operate out of the Red Barn Kitchen Incubator. We're there every Tuesday evening, um, milling flour, rolling oats, packaging products. Um, and then in the spring um, of 2019, now we're thinking about buying a mill. And at, at first, we, we thought initially we were thinking we had to buy um, a 30,000 Austrian mill. Our initial research and what we were thinking, that's where we thought we had to go. But we began to realize, well, no, the scale that we're at, we don't need to incur that high capital costs. We can just basically start with where we are. And we decided to instead $30,000, a $1,500 uh, Como Finibus XL mill purchased from um, Pleasant Hill Grain out of Nebraska. I think we have a picture of that. If you can advance it, Amanda. Yeah. And that's the Finibus XL right there. And that mill was a, it's a real workhorse. It really allowed us to do the things that we needed to do at the time. It's a stone mill, uh, produces roughly anywhere from 30 to 35 pounds an hour. And it, again, it was just perfect for where we were at the scale that we were at. Um, and so that's, that's what we started with. And then now summer, 2019, um, Ruthie Peretti um, of Ruthie's Farm in Marksboro, New Jersey, um, was, har was getting ready to harvest five acres of warthog winter wheat. And initially we thought we would just sell, take a small portion and, and sell it locally. But Ruthie decided um, to let's keep it all. And it came out to roughly 7,200 pounds. Um, Thankfully, and um, the Genesis Farm uh, in Blairstown, um, they have, um, we had the wheat in a, in a big gravity wagon, basically the same wagon that you saw in the previous photo here. Um, we kept the warthog winter wheat in that wagon uh, and again, that presented us with, with right storage challenges, which will I will get back. To, uh, I will I'll talk about further a little later on. Um, but we were lucky. Tom, Ruthie's farmer Tom Bennett let us keep the grain in the gravity wagon, and then Genesis Farm um, provided us with space at a barn nearby where we can keep the gravity wagon so that you're, you're keeping the grain off the ground, rodent free, and then we uh, would clean as needed and use as needed. And again, that was in our summer of 2019. Uh, now to this year, March, 2020, um, <clears throat> as we're seeing more demand picked up, um, and it coincided with um, the emergence, unfortunately, the emergence of the pandemic. Um, so in March, April this year, with the increased um, demand, increased activity that we were seeing, whether on our website or other channels, um, we upgraded to another Como mill. Uh, Next slide, I think, Amanda. Yeah, there it is, the Jumbo. And again, purchased from Pleasant Hill Grain in Nebraska. And this mill, uh, we were fortunate, we were lucky that this was the last one Pleasant Hill Grain had at the time, um, back in late March, early April. Uh, so it was very timely. And this mill produces about, again, stone mill, everything that we mill is whole wheat, and this produces about 65 pounds an hour. So. 
a significant upgrade from the Fitabis, which again was doing roughly anywhere between 30 to 35 pounds an hour. Um, so, and that's again, very timely, allowed us to keep up with the demand. Uh, it's been terrific. And then um, at the end of September now in the fall, uh, we just purchased the second jumbo mill. So now we have two jumbo mills with each one producing uh, 65 pounds an hour. Uh, and then to go back to the storage piece, um, another piece of infrastructure that we have put in place, and we learned this directly from Joe Steinman of Small Valley Milling, from Henry Byler of Holson Matthews, the, the issue of storage, which Elizabeth again had discussed in the video. And th that was a topic that we were always concerned with. Well, conversations with Joel and Henry, hey, why not purchase, get a trailer? It's really um, a great remedy, um, keeping the grain off the ground. And um, so we purchased the trailer as well um, at the end of September, uh, $3,000. Um, and the reason why we purchased that because the farmers, another farmer um, in Alamuchi Township um, harvested quite a bit of spring wheat and quite a bit of, of oats. And so where would we keep all of that? Well, let's have purchase a trailer and that's pr uh, currently where we are storing those products that's helped us solve that that storage peak and maybe um maybe because we're running a little a little out of time len why don't um i just do a little bit um of cleanup on the processing and then you can move into some marketing tips yeah, absolutely. I was actually, I was finished right there with the storage piece. So Okay, yeah. great. So Amanda, can you put on my processing? I've just have a couple of slides. We'll summarize that. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. I'm pulling it up now. Okay. Thanks so much, Amanda. Of course. Um, so uh, River Valley Community Grains has just been a tremendous success story. Uh, they've been working um, so closely with New Jersey farmers, and uh, they're really, really taking off. So if we can get the processing up, there we go, um, and just go to the second slide. Okay, so I just wanted to summarize some principles of processing that you've seen now from all three entities, and I summarize that this is the French method. And that is build a cottage industry that produces equipment that is scale appropriate, efficient, and safe. And right here, you're seeing the oat roller that River Valley Grains owns. And let's go through this. This is a cottage industry. Um, I saw an oat crimper that the Amish were using for their horses, and it looked intriguing. So two Amish, uh, two Mennonite farmers converted it for me into an oat roller by taking the crimping rolls and making them into knurled rolls. And then uh, the oat, uh, it was manufactured by an Amish shop. Um, and then it was put on, it was motorized by Peter Martin of Green Bank Motors and a stand and shield, so safety by Joe Lapp at Sunnyburn Welding. These are all local, small scale um, entrepreneurs working in New York and, and Pennsylvania, and you can be working in New Jersey soon. So that's one thing. We've developed a cottage industry that, that, that produces mills, dehullers, this oat roller. Another thing is to look out for used equipment. Um, you know, the Sosnowski is the only new grain cleaner I recommend. I really like you to, to buy the older wooden air screen cleaners. Those retail between $250 and $1,000 and you get a fantastic cleaner. So look out for used equipment and then as your scale increases, think Small Valley Milling now, then consider commercial options um, and start 
start buying um, new, uh, more uh, large scale equipment. Could you show me the next slide, Amanda? And then remember for processing quality and safety first, you need to be inspected and licensed. It's not as it's not difficult. Uh, it's technically the FDA oversees it, but it really it's the state agencies you deal with. If you need help, contact Ogren and I can get you in touch with the right people. There are quality standards, the most important of which is vomitoxin. We've talked about that before. We need to hold the line. We need to have pristine product there. There are other grain quality parameters and you can find more about that on the Ogren website. And uh, here you can see what uh, Len was referring to, the small scale storage. This happens to be Lamar Stauffer's, which he uh, takes a step further and, ref and refrigerates and also controls humidity. And then you can see again what Joel was talking about, the vacuum packed puff spelt. So um, be canny about your equipment purchases. There are plenty of homegrown um, processing equipment that you can buy. Look for used equipment. Um, and then also hold what you really have to hold to hard is uh, high quality food products and safety for both you and your customers. So maybe we can move into um, uh, marketing. Yep, sure thing, pulling that up now. Okay. And um, do we have time to show the Scott Morgan marketing clip? Um, well, we're running up on seven o'clock now. Uh, Nikki said, what do you think? Well, here's why don't we why don't we go quickly into this? This is just a summary of the marketing um, from Ogren's perspective. So we're lucky we have five different markets in terms of end product that you can access the milling market the malting market, distilling, feed and seed. Um, and these all have different requirements. You can find the requirements for that on the Ogren website. But that means that even if something goes wrong, let's say you have high vomitoxin content, you can still sell to the distilling or possibly the feed and seed market. So you have a whole bunch of options that help to reduce your risk. Next slide, please. Um, the marketing channels, and we'll hear from Len and Larry in a minute about these. Direct to consumer, that, give, that forces all the responsibility for packaging, marketing, and distribution on you. On the other hand, you capture all the value. And you can look at those retail prices. These are for some organically, uh, locally grown organic wheat berries. You can see the prices are quite high. Next slide, please. Um, uh, there are other marketing channels, and you'll you'll hear that Len and Larry, River River Valley Community Grains is all are also working with these channels. You can sell to restaurants, bakeries, and retail food stores for high prices, not as high as direct to consumers, but still pretty high. Or you can sell in bulk to processors, millers, mills, distilleries, malting facilities, and you can see the modern varieties there go for twenty seven to forty cents a pound. Heritage and ancient grains from fifty to a to a dollar a pound, mm -hmm. and there you can there we haven't done a lot of this yet, but there are real opportunities here to partner with millers, bakers, distillers, maltsters, and even to form cooperatives and food hubs. So that's just a quick run through uh, marketing. Maybe uh, Len and and Larry, you can talk about the marketing you're doing for about five minutes, and then we'll throw it open to questions. Sure, that sounds great, Elizabeth. Hi, everyone. This is Larry. Um, you know, Elizabeth really synthesized the experience that we've had um, around the marketing, the distribution of the products. You know, Len spoke to the journey about the equipment, um, the oat roller in the mills, and actually the grains themselves. Um, so we established ourselves along that timeline in early 2019. Uh, with some local farmers markets, just to be able to have a presence, uh, be able to demonstrate to people what products are available um, and kind of, you know, take in all the feedback and what that experience was telling us. Early on when we were doing our, our 
uh, community discussions about the feasibility and the interest of, of doing small grains in the area, there were logically and naturally a lot of challenges because it was something new, it was unknown. The focus of trying to bring reality to this, this concept, um, this was another part of the piece, education. Uh, what was the market receptivity? And we saw an evolution of going from, you know, four farmers markets uh, during 2019 and making relationships and making connections with um, local restaurants, um, other, you know, retailers of, of local products and natural foods. Um, and the interest is, was tremendous. Um, uh, just, let me let me just interject. Amanda, can you get their their presentation back up because they have some nice pictures of some of their markets. Go ahead. Sorry, Larry. Okay, no, yeah, thank you. Give me one That's great. Yeah, I was I'm just talking. I'm not even looking at the screen. Um, thank you. Uh, so uh, it you you look at the the word of mouth and and the effort to talk to people about it. You, you, you hear the interest and then you try it you know it's not a it's not a tremendous commitment if you're maybe a retailer you know they can maybe bring in you know five ten bags of flour or ten bags of rolled oats um you know it's something that you can tell a story about you can have branding at the location to speak to in our case our mission statement and what it is that we're doing and what we're working with what was really great um, Lenny mentioned Ruthie Peretti's farm in Marksboro, New Jersey. That was kind of the main um, effort back in 2019 that you know gave us that winter week. Um, well, they Ruthie and her and, and, and her family, or her husband uh, Eric, have a pizzeria in uh, Montclair, New Jersey. So they were using it. They were growing it. They were using it. They were talking about it in the neighborhood. So the connections that evolved in just that Montclair area and the interest led to more experience, you know, more um, awareness, if you will, about the interest in, in small grains. You couple that with the farmers markets, um, you get some samples to you know, bakers, um, and they start trying it. You know, now you start to build that um, recurrence of, of that customer base. You know, various quantities could be five pounds, could be 10 pounds, could be 50, could be 150. Um, what we've recently seen is that there's a lot of bakers that have their own mills. So they're willing to acquire the raw product of the grain berries themselves. It's spelt, it's wheat, it's einkorn. Um, and that's a very easy transition because we don't have to process it. We don't have to mill it. We don't have to roll the oats. So we're kind of creating that um, value proposition, if you will, about making the connection between the end product and the uh, in the market, and and the growers that are investing. In the beginning, growers said, I "Don't want you know, I, I don't necessarily want to completely reinvent my business model, but if you help me in guiding me on how to grow it in the right way, I'm I'm more open to that." And that's really where Elizabeth has come into play. It's such a huge benefit to us to be able to speak to the growers guide them through that journey. And then we kind of created our focus and investment around the infrastructure to support the growers as they harvested the grains. But we will take it, as Lenny mentioned, the storage. We have the processing now here in Long Valley. And through the last you know 18 months of starting at farmer's markets and building relationships, we have a pretty strong uh, customer base um, that is, is needing us to grow at the right scale. That's why we have two jumbo mills using the oat rollers so it's uh it's, it's been a great validation in, in not just concepts but in community because people care people recognize people realize what it is that is happening here and, and they want to be a part of it yeah can you commanda can you show slides four five and six so there's your community kitchen right yep. yeah yeah and uh the next slide so they're look at the look at the kind of marketing they're doing. So they're also pushing on this just Jersey, right? Right. Yeah. So you're you're being included with other Jersey yeah. produced products. Yeah. So Next slide. go ahead. I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah, so uh, if you just go back to the previous slide, Susan Virilius uses our oats, our rolled oats, and her granola and her oat bites, which you see in the uh, uh, right hand side in that with that red uh, package. 
And then uh, with the buckwheat that we mill, um, she's created a pancake mix for us. So this Just Jersey puts together these, you know, corporate gifts or, you know, gifts. And you look at the diversity of local products. It's, it's it really it gets your interest. It gets the consumer's interest. Local maple syrup, coffee, pancakes, rolled oats. It's pretty powerful. Then the next slide. And this is how you really started, right? Yeah. You got some, you, you worked with some local New Jersey growers. You, you got some product together and bam, you went to yeah. some local markets and it was, why weren't the sales pretty phenomenal? You sold out. It was, yeah, it was shocking. You know, in the, in the beginning, there was some reservation because the awareness wasn't there. But when, when customers saw us there on a regular basis, they engaged us in discussion. Um, then they would try it. And then after a while, it would, it's, you know, we have people coming back to us every week now at these markets, buying a multitude of products because they just need to have it on hand. And they love the fact that it's you know local, whether it be in New Jersey uh, and the increased hyper-local um, uh, growth of the spring wheat and the, uh, and the oats um, in, uh, in Alamuchi, New Jersey, right near Marksboro, um, we're finding homes for it. Yeah, so this is an excellent example of the possibilities for New Jersey. You have one of the best markets in the country because you not only have the behemoths of uh, New York City and Philadelphia close by, but New Jersey is densely populated. So you have your own local markets. And River Valley has been, has been taking advantage of that and helping a lot of farmers to boost their bottom line. So we're so thankful for you to, to come and talk about it. Um, and notice that they have a diverse marketing strategy. They sell direct to consumers at farmer markets. They sell to bakeries. They sell to other retail outlets. And that is, of course, the best strategy to have because you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. So with that, we're a little bit late, but we have time for a few questions. Um, I'm seeing some in chat, but maybe um, Nagisa and Amanda, you can, you can, uh, if you have questions now, please ask them either in chat or uh, we'll unmute mute yourself and ask. So um, Elizabeth, I think um, Sam Rose had a couple questions. Okay. The first one. I think you answered, but I'm not sure we really answered his question because he, I think he wanted to know the scale of Henry Byler's farm. Okay, so the reason that we, we brought you both Henry Byler and Small Valley Milling is Henry Byler is a, is a micro grain farm and grain processing operation. Henry is growing maybe between five to 15 acres of grain and he's processing it. He's, we didn't get into this, but he's selling einkorn seed, seed to plant. That's very important. Notice that's one of the markets I mentioned. It's a very lucrative market. He sells then flour and he sells berries. And he's, he's increasing, his demand is increasing so much that he now has to buy in. He only, he only plants up to maybe 15 acres of grain himself, but he now is buying in 20 to 30 acres more. Small Valley Milling is a larger operation, much larger. They, they grow up to 350 acres themselves, but they're buying in a lot more than that to keep up with demand. And then I think he had one more question. Um, if a grain farmer has a stand on site, what would it take in general terms to outfit a corner store in order to use a mock mill or a small mill to make some bags of flour in compliance with ag and markets? Yeah, so I, we can research this a little more, but my experience is that farmers who take their grain to a farmer's market if you, if you set up a small tabletop mill and have the consumers mill their own grain, which they love to do, I don't think that has to be licensed. It'll depend on the, it'll depend on the farmer's market. It's when you set up a farm, a grain processing um, enterprise on your farm that you need to be licensed as a, a grain processing enterprise, which is not as difficult as you think. It's uh, 
um, it, it it's step by step and it's pretty easy to do. Len, Larry, do you want to add anything to that? Mm -hmm. oh. Larry, you're on mute. Yep, Zach, thank you. Um, I, yeah, I think Elizabeth's right. You just have to, you know, look at what's uh, acceptable, you know, in the area, which is why we found the commercial kitchen here in Long Valley, because that got us the health inspections and all the serve safe certifications that we needed in order to uh, prepare and, and process the products yeah. to, bring, to bring to any kind of market. So Elizabeth, I know we're at time, but do you want to play Scott's video and that at the end so that if anybody wants to stay and watch it, we'll keep recording and playing the video? Yeah, I think this is an excellent example of a, of a real entrepreneurial spirit. You, those of you that have been in the course previously, you've seen Scott Morgan with this combine. Now listen to him on some marketing tips. It's really good. And thank you so much for joining us. Yes, thank you everyone for joining us again. Thank you. Thank all you. right, so I'm gonna play it. So feel free to hang up if you want to, but I'm gonna play the video just so you can all hear it. All right. Can you tell me again, do you mind, Scott? Don't answer if you don't want to, but what what is your price range for einkorn kernels? So I am able to sell einkorn at market for $7 a pound, either as flour or whole berries. Do you, do you find the consumers are interested in einkorn? Uh, I have a lot of discussion. Uh, this year, there's been a big resurgence in home baking from just like a wider audience. So there has been a lot of interest this year. Uh, it helps that I ran out of my modern wheat. So, you know, it just kind of drives that conversation a little further, a little faster in terms of what is einkorn, how is it good, um, how, is it, how is it best used. And once you tell people that you can... It, to treat it like pastry flour because it's got a lower protein, a lower gluten content. Then people start to get the idea, oh, I can make scones, crepes, you, well, you uh, can, you can, pie crusts, you things can, like that. You can, in fact, make bread, but it, it, it takes a little, you have to Right, you have you've to got go, to be more patient. Yeah, you've got to do a little slower fragile, yeah. folding, gluten and building methods. What do you, you know, you were saying that, that in this, this last uh, marketing uh, venture after the pandemic hit, that they're, they were interested in because you had some of it. But um, another thing that, that folks are interested in einkorn, and you can see it, it's nice marketing, is that golden cover, the color, the high glute, uh, lutein content. Yeah. Are they interested in this? So it's, it's yeah. extremely nutritious. Yeah, when you put the whole wheat flour from my hard red winter wheat bagged right next to, in a clear plastic bag right next to the, the, the einkorn, mm -hmm. that einkorn just has this beautiful yellow color tone to it. Yeah. Yeah. Even in the flour, so not just on the on the grain right. husk itself or on the bran. It's the flour. The whole yeah. flour itself. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's really beautiful. It's got some really nice flavor. All right. Well, so I think that might be it for tonight. Um, if you please, please feel free to um, to visit my the Ogren website. Um, also, uh, River Valley Grains has a nice website. If you need help, if you if you want more information on processing and marketing, just reach out to Ogren. On my website, you can find my um, email. There's my phone number, uh, and I can put you in touch with people like River Valley Grain or uh, Small Valley Milling, various uh, very good farmers and processors and marketers, and they'd be. They are, they're willing to share information with you. So don't be shy. Great. OK, thank you very much. Oh, I just to briefly mentioned that we do have another course going on before the end of the, C, um, the end of the year, which is the Road to Certification. So if you are interested in getting certified and as, as an organic grower, please uh, sign up for that course. All right. Thank you all. Thank you, Nofa, New Jersey. Thank you, River Valley Community Grains. This yeah, has been thank wonderful. You. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.